Introduction to Software Defined Networks, Part 1 Virtualization Basics. Hi, this is Daryl Tano of Solutions Reservoir, and thanks for watching Part 1 of this Introduction to SDN. We'll touch on some of the basics of server and network virtualization, but if you're already familiar with this, check out Part 2. Slides for reference have yellow backgrounds. I won't address them, but you may want to pause and read them. If you think of your laptop as a server and describe it physically, you'd mention its processor, RAM, and hard drive. Then there's an operating system on which your applications run. Note that at a given moment, your machine is characterized by these attributes plus the momentary contents of your RAM and hard drive. In fact, if a snapshot of your machine's contents could instantly appear in a similar machine, you could move to the second machine without a hitch. This software and state of your machine are elements of server virtualization. Odds are that you're not overly exercising your machine. In fact, if somehow it could be handled carefully, your machine could be shared with other users, which is one of the drivers for virtualizing servers. There's another physical element of your laptop to mention. It's communications portal. Your network interface card contains a unique MAC address, and your machine probably has one MAC for wired Ethernet and one for Wi-Fi. A powerful server underlies server virtualization. Now, instead of directly installing an operating system, software called a hypervisor is installed. The hypervisor is sophisticated software that manages sharing the physical resources of the server, and this managed sharing leads to virtualization. Here are some of the names you'll hear of hypervisor providers. On the virtualized server, your applications run on an operating system, just like on your laptop. Now, however, the hypervisor provides the mediation between the server's resources and various operating systems and applications. If you were working on this server, one of these units, called a virtual machine or VM, would be presented to you exactly like your own machine. What we now have is a highly efficient level of sharing of physical resources and their attendant costs. For added efficiency, this sharing of resources is done on a statistical basis across all users. This resource and cost sharing are elements of virtualized compute in the cloud. Recall that we mentioned the instantly snapshotted state of your laptop, and that if that state could be moved to another machine, you wouldn't notice the change. In virtualization and cloud, a given momentary state is called an instance, and snapshots are taken and stored regularly. Instances and snapshots become the basis for moving your VM and providing a restoral point should there be a failure. Now, through the hypervisor, a number of VMs are supported on this now virtualized physical server, which is attached to a switch. There is a module of the hypervisor that creates a virtual switch. Akin to the physical side, the hypervisor creates virtual network adapters through which the virtual machines communicate with or through the virtual switch and eventually through the physical switch. And just like a physical server can have more than one network adapter, the hypervisor can assign more than one virtual network adapter to a VM. Although these virtual network adapters exist as software, the hypervisor must assign them valid MAC addresses and private or public IP addresses for their ultimately real communications. So virtual machines use valid MAC and IP addresses to communicate via the virtual switch with neighbor VMs and or entities beyond their physical server. Let's not forget that much of this connection will take place over a physical network that ultimately imposes its own networking rules. The diagram represents a data center with virtualized servers, customer VMs, a physical network, and storage. Suppose that the needs of some VMs on server B are expanding, and what we'd like to do is move, say, this VM to server C to better utilize server resources. Recall that what's, that what's really moving is the snapshot of the VM. This movement is done in stages to preserve move transparency to the VM's users. For operational considerations, this move was impractical if it crossed IP subnet boundaries. Only with virtual networking, in which a layer of IP addressing is created above and independent of that of the physical network, can VMs practically be moved across such boundaries. This solves a major problem 
particularly felt in the data set. You will hear terms describing the direction of traffic flow. North-south traffic basically flows in a hierarchical fashion, shown here as between VMs and ultimately the internet. Spanning tree protocol fosters this kind of directional flow. East-west traffic tends to flow more on what you might call a peer-to-peer -peer basis, such as between VMs, or as shown here, between VMs and resources like storage. In closing, we note the analog of server and network virtualization. We've seen how the hypervisor is the intermediary between the resource of the physical server and the VMs. So multiple virtual machines or servers exist on the physical server, and each VM runs as if it were a distinct physical machine. On the network side, we have a physical network, and through network virtualization, under the power of what's generally called the controller, entities such as VMs can share the operating characteristics, including security and addressing freedom, of distinct physical networks. Just like the hypervisor provides all the magic masking and translations for the VMs, the controller does the same on the network level. We'll see more of this in part two. See you there.